Hey everybody, Sean from Canadian Brew Channel. How you doing today? Um, my last video I did was on a Nutty Brown Ale, if you'd watched that. I had fun doing that, but the issues I'm having is uh, I've got a GoPro camera. It's kind of old. It's, an, it's a Hero 3, and um, I've been using my phone uh, for the last while to record stuff, but I'm just not happy with the audio uh, that I get out of it, and, and also the video sometimes isn't very good. So I am using my Hero 3 right now. Um, I've got my little microphone here, so I'm hope, hoping it uh, gives a better uh, insight into my voice and also the picture's a little better. But um, today's video, I want to talk about what I've learned using the Claw Hammer Supply brew system. I put a video up about probably a year and a half ago when I first bought the system, and I'm starting to see more people using it. So I thought I'd do an update because what I've learned along the way has been uh, helpful for myself and I want to share it uh, with the pros and cons of using a brew in a basket style unit. So with no further ado, let's talk about the Clawhammer Supply unit. Cheers. Hey guys, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, the different things I've done with the supply uh, unit, the claw hammer supply unit, or I should say claw hammer supply brewing machine, because I, I do like it. Um, I'm just going to put video over top as I speak. It's probably easier to do that way than moving the camera all around. So the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, was brew efficiency. Now. I was weary when I bought it that I'm used to getting a brew efficiency of about 80%. Uh, and I don't mean a brew house efficiency, I mean what you get when you put the grain in, when you crush your grain, how much sugar you get out of the uh, grain, depending on what temperature you mash at. So what I've done and I found that works the best with the claw hammer supply is a fine crush, as fine as you can get it. or what claw hammer has now started to say more often in the last year was do a double crush so you can do that as well i just i crush mine once i do it really fine and i end up with an efficiency around 70 to 73 percent um i like i used to get 85 when i had my other system which was just using uh, a standard uh, you know uh, basically i would do like um, a sparge uh, i do a fly sparge so with the brew in the basket or brew in the bucket, whatever you want to call it, brew in a bag, you can't really do a fly sparge. You could maybe sparge a little bit of uh, hot water or not really hot water. You don't want to get tannins out of the, the, um, the mash, but you could do that. But I find that it's just almost not worth it. So I do a fine crush. And the second thing I'll do is I'll add maybe another pound of, um, of grain to, to help with the efficiency as well because of well, the efficiency to bring my sugar levels up. Um, another thing that I've found that works well for me uh, was when I'm doing a mash, I actually uh, created, I just bought like an insulation blanket and I basically just use that wrapped around the bucket or the container while it's in a mash to hold the temperature better. And the system, you can dial it in to let's say 150 or whatever you're gonna mash at. What I usually do is I will mash in a couple degrees above that so that it drops down around 150. And then I'll turn the heat off and I'll leave the pump on for about five minutes just to get everything all the same temperature. And then I'll just basically leave it like that for at least 15, 20 minutes. Then I'll stir it again and then I'll run the pump for maybe another 10 minutes and I'll watch the temperature. And if it starts to drop a little bit, I will just turn it on for a few minutes to bring it back up. Um, another thing I found that works really well on the claw hammer supply actual brewing unit itself, which is the brain, is it has a manual mode and it has also like an automatic mode. So what I was doing, which works really well, is when I'm like gonna do a boil, and sometimes you use it for mashing as well, is I put it into manual mode, and then you can adjust the percentage of 
how much the heater comes on from like 1% to 100%. So when I was going to do like, let's say a boil, I put it into manual mode and I just put it 100% and it would keep that heater on 100% of the time. And you wouldn't want to leave it because then you could have like a boil over. But what I would do is I'd, I'd hang around and watch it heat up. And then when it got up to the boil, um, if it was going to have the, uh, the hot break was going to happen, I could either just turn the heat off, which is really easy to do with it, or I could just lower it down to like a 50% boil, 15% uh, 50 uh, of the time that it's on, time that it's off, and just put it in that mode, and it works really well. So what I, I found didn't work as well is leaving it in the auto mode where you tell it, let's say you want to keep it at just at the boiling point. Um, here it's about 207 uh, Fahrenheit is boiling point here because we're uh, because of we're a little bit above sea level by I think it's a thousand feet or something so you don't go to 212 but what I found works the best was putting it in that manual mode and I could actually tweak it to get a nice rolling boil it worked really really well so I find manual mode works the best um, another thing that I did that works pretty well is I built out of copper a, a tube that hooks over top of the, uh, the boil kettle and allows me to do like a whirlpool. And, and it works really well when I'm doing a cooling because the Clyhammer supply comes a, with a really good uh, cold pl or a plate chiller, which is really fast. And what I do is I run it through the plate chiller and let it go back and just do a circulation and it cools it down usually within about uh, I'd say 10 minutes it goes from you know 212 down to pitching temperature of about 70 degrees it works really really well uh, the one thing I still got to figure out what I want to do with the claw hammer supply uh, unit is there is a fair amount of beer that can be left behind when you're you're uh, draining it into your fermenter so you end up having to tip the bucket back which is fine except for if you're trying to put a cone of all the tube and everything in the middle and leave it there it can end up causing it to get into your fermenter which i don't want so i'm trying to figure out if anyone out there is using clawham supply and they figured out a way to be able to pull the uh, the wart at the bottom better than using what they basically give you as a bazooka screen. You can't run it without the bazooka screen, by the way. If you want to use the very top lid has a little spray nozzle on it to help when you're doing your um, your mashing. It'll get plugged up. You, you can't do it that way. So I'm figuring either I'm not going to use the spray nozzle on this unit or uh, and take the bazooka off or I've got to find another way to filter this somehow because that is a bit of an issue if you're losing like, you know, a half a gallon of wort that you don't want to lose and then when you tilt your bucket then you get all of the, uh, the tube and everything going in there which I don't, I don't really specifically like. So that's one thing I'm trying to work on, some kind of a pickup tube like you see in a Blickman system that will allow it to pull even more out. I did have a little tube that I hooked into my older system that was uh, using basically propane and it worked really well it would pull it almost down to nothing and i could do a whirlpool and have a big cone of tube in the middle and leave it all behind so that's that's something that i'm definitely trying to work on with this climber supply other than that I'm, I'm happy with the system it heats up really well it's all electric which is great doesn't mean i have any propane inside um and that it's been pretty good so for that point i hope some of you guys can maybe help me out if, if you're a using the claw hammer supply because i know once i put this video out i'm going to get a lot of people watching it because i'm going to put the claw hammer supply in it uh in my title and I, I said i do have a 230 volt system i know there's a lot of people out there with the 110 but mine's a 20 gallon system and it's awesome i have actually been able to push out not quite at the 15 gallon mark yet but i have been able to push out uh, I believe it was 13 gallons total beer out of it at one point. Now it was um, a Corona style that I was doing, so I didn't need to have as much in the mash. Um, and I added some sugar on top of that. That brings me to another point about when you're trying to get a higher gravity uh, beer in this, you can do it with the 20 gallon, no problem. You can get a five gallon batch out of this easy and have a high gravity beer. What if you want a 10 gallon batch? Because I have, 
I've got many kegs that I can fill up. So I like to do my batches normally in 10 gallons. So I, I brew less, but I can take my time and uh, brew the beer that I want and have two, two five gallon batches, which lasts quite a lot longer than a five does. Um, so I have started going to using either a dry malt extract or just plain cane sugar and just adding that to bring up my gravity, my original gravity up, so that I'm not having to worry about the big mash that I gotta deal with. I have had times where I'm trying to get like an 8% beer, a 10 gallon batch, and there's just almost practically no room in here to have all that mashing in there. So uh, what I have sometimes done is I will mash at the max that I can, and then when I take the, the mash out and I just have my wort, I'll add some more malt extract to it or some cane sugar to bring that up as well. And it's, and it's worked fine. So that's the one thing you got to think about too, is if you like to do 10 gallon batches, um, you definitely going to want to have the 20 gallon for sure. And if you want to do heavier ones, a higher gravity, you're looking at like an 8% or seven and a half, eight percent you're going to probably have to add sugar on top of that because I just, there's not enough room in there. Um, it's really hard. And plus, because because the efficiency, you're not getting 85% efficiency in the system. You're going to get around 68 to 70, maybe a little higher if you really crush your green fine. So you do have to uh, add extra sugars for that. So I have found that that works well with my climber supply uh, system. Another thing that I've done uh, on, and you see it in my original video I did of the Claw Hammer Supply, is I got a pulley system. You have to have a pulley system if you are going to use a 20 gallon system. It is just so heavy. If you're doing a double batch, I don't know how much it weighs. It must weigh maybe 50 pounds. And unless it's on the ground, you can't lift it. There's no way if it's at you know a regular table height and then you go to lift it up, you're gonna hurt your back. I don't care who you are. It's it's very heavy. So pulley system, you can get them anywhere. I tried to find one that it was an electric system. I I couldn't find one that was worth the money. A lot of them were 12 volt, and I just didn't want to have to deal with it. I just wanted one you just plug in. I never found one. So I went with a cheap pulley system. Uh, the only thing was the one I bought. The rope that was on it was horrible. It was like a uh, like a nylon rope, you get like a cheap nylon rope that has like the braiding in it, a very not fine braiding. It came apart. Within about three times of using it, it just started to come undone. So I went and got a finer nylon rope for like four bucks for like 50 feet of it. And it works great. It stays in the grooves. It's easy to use. It's smooth. And I'm telling you, using a system is so simple. It, it works really well. On, on the second thing on that is I also have like a little dolly system that I use so that I can move the pot back and forth. The reason I have to do that is because I have a hood that's up above for getting rid of most of the moisture when I'm uh, doing my boil and there's, there's nowhere to put the hoist and there's not enough room to lift it up. So I have to actually shift it to the side and then lift it up. If you have a larger area and you don't have to worry about the moisture the same, then you're not going to need to have this little dolly, but the dolly works really well. Uh, I thought at first of maybe putting on a mat and pulling it, but I thought I'm not, I don't want to do that and have all this hot water all over the place. So this system I have with the little dolly works really well. So I'd recommend that if you, uh, you're going to have this claw hammer system that you would definitely, if you need to for the height to lift this up, you're going to want to get a dolly. If you watch the guys at claw hammer, they got a really, it looks like a pretty high ceiling that they have. And I have seen those guys when they're trying to lift it by hand, which they normally do because I think that a lot of them times they're using the 10 gallon batch unit. I think I did see them use the 20 gallon once and they looked like they were struggling to lift that up when it was a, I think it was a large heavy beer that they were doing. So keep that in mind. Pulley system works great up here and also having the little dolly back and forth works great as well. Another thing I want to point out and someone's asked me this, I live in Canada. There is no... CSA approval I see on this at all, but I when I opened it up and looked at it, it's well done inside. It looks really, really good. It It's not like it was just thrown together. It has a little control board on the front. Um, I know there's other companies like uh, Spike Brewing that have like mechanical knobs and stuff, which I think is pretty cool too. This one's all touchpad and it, it's, it's done very well. The first thing I did though when I got it uh, is I took out a, I took the you can open up the front and I tightened down everything in there that 
had a screw on it. I didn't want anything loose from shipping, or maybe they missed it in production, so I tightened everything down. The plug as well, I took the plug back and tightened everything on the plug, put it back together, um, and made sure that that was nice and tight. But one of the things I did is, like I said, it has no CSA on it, and also you're dealing with water and electricity. So I did put it on a, a GFI, a GCFI, which is a ground circuit interrupter fault. It's basically looking for, um, or fault interrupter, it's looking for any millivolts that are leaking back through the ground or through a ne neutral. It will trip off really quickly so that you don't get... basically that's what it's for so what i did is i looked on my breaker panels older and i tried to look for a, a gfi breaker and it was gonna be like 500 bucks because i needed a 30 amp and i'm like because it's an older panel I'm, like, I'm not paying that but i want to be safe so what i ended up doing is i went to home depot and i got a spa panel which is a 60 amp uh, gfi which is for like we have a hot tub outside right and I just basically put a regular breaker in my panel, 30 amp. Then I went to the uh, the panel, for the spa panel, which is a 60 amp, and then went through that. So now that part from there to my pot is now safe. Some of you are going to say, "Well, you got it running on a 60 amp breaker now." No, I don't, because once you go to the panel, it's on a 30 amp breaker, so it is all protected. That way, I'm safe. Uh, there's, I don't have to worry about having any electrical issues in the house. It's, it's the way you have to go. You can't run this system, you should not run this system without putting it on a ground fault circuit interrupter. Uh, it, you have to, okay? It's, it's for life or death. And you wanna make beer a long time. So that is something you're definitely gonna wanna do. And like I said, I think it was a hundred bucks uh, or maybe a little less than that, maybe $85 for the panel uh, versus like I said, it was gonna be $500 for that breaker in my panel. Now, if you have a newer panel, you probably can get it cheaper than what I was looking for, but my panel's about 25 years old and they're not making a lot of breakers for that panel anymore, so it was gonna be too expensive. So you can always go by getting yourself a spa a panel and it, and it works just fine. Okay, the last, I don't even know if you call this a tip, but what I do on my cleaning um, is I take everything apart on the supply climber supply system. I've seen where there's been videos I've seen where people, you know, they clean it all out, but then it shows them running water and caustic cleaner through it every time they brew with it. That would take a long, long time. So what I end up doing is once I finish the brew day, I uh, get like my grain obviously is not in there. It was in the basket. That's all cleaned out. I then take the heater out because there's a clamp it comes out really easy. I take the heater to the sink and I scrub it with a brush and it all comes off very easily if you do it every time that you use a system. So it takes me maybe five minutes to clean the, uh, the heater by itself, no problem. I then take the whole brew kettle over to my sink. You need a fair size sink for this, it's, this is pretty big and I just basically lightly scrub everything, clean it all. Uh, sometimes I'll take off the actual um, connectors for the probe, for temperature probe, and also for the opening and closing ball valves, just to make sure nothing's building up inside of there. I'll take that all apart. Not every time I brew, maybe every five or six times, and basically just spray it down with some sanitizer, and I just let it air dry. Uh, the one other thing I will say you wanna do is I'd never had a pump before. I got a pump down here that came with a system. Pump works great, but you have to take it apart every single time. The first couple times I used this system, I did run some sanitized water through it. I sprayed down through the pump and thought everything would be fine. Well, it's not. There's little grooves inside of the pump, little impellers. You can't get everything out. So I remember the first time that I went to use the system on my second time and the tubing that comes with it, the silicone tubing, is semi-clear. You can kind of see through it. I see these little green chunks of something go up. I'm like, what was that? It was mold, right? Because it's been sitting there for like a week uh, together and wet. So now every time I take it apart and it's pretty straightforward, I'll just give you just a quick look at the uh, these little pieces that, there's the impeller there, and that's the magnet drive that basically the impeller goes into, okay? And then there's the uh, the actual stainless steel piece that whoops, <laughs> fall out of there. This whole thing uh, goes together, okay, like that. So it only has six screws that hold it together on the pump 
uh, body itself. It takes me about two minutes to take it apart. I just, I just rinse it off and soak it in some sanitizer for a couple minutes and let it air dry. And that's sitting there from a week ago. I just leave it apart. And then when I go to put it together, it's, it's not a big deal. It takes me three or four minutes to put it together. It's dry, no more mold. So that is something I had to get used to doing. Um, also, if you're not used to using a, a plate chiller, which I was, you want to make sure that you uh, rinse that plate chiller out very well. I use uh, some hot water and then some regular water, warm water, and then I run, I soak it in sanitizer and then I drain it out because you want to get anything that's in that plate chiller out of there. Like it could be trube or it could be pieces of hops. You don't want to sit in there because then it's going to grow mold and eventually it will plug it and you won't be able to use your plate chiller anymore. Um, I know a lot of people that use other chillers, I find that a plate chiller is really cool. And I liked it, I can just run it through. And I'm not worried about waiting, you know, hours for my system to cool down before I can pitch it. It's in 10 minutes and I can keep the lid on and just let it run through and then I'm good to go. So I hope some of these tips will help you guys out. Again, uh, if you have any questions on this system, I'll answer whatever I can. But so far, I, I am enjoying the system. Uh, I know there's other competitors out there that have systems that have come in recently as well but i do believe that a brewing bucket or brewing basket or brewing a bag system for small brews like 5 10 gallon 15 gallon is the way to go i uh, i really was looking at buying a system that had all three tanks in it you know you got your hot liquor tank and then you got your mash ton and then you got your boil kettle now you got maybe two pumps and you've got all sorts of two heaters i I just decided I'm going with one system, less cleaning, the better. Um, I am happy with it. I like the single vessel brew system. I can't say enough about it, whether it's Clawhammer or somebody else. So this is Sean signing off. I know I've been going on for a while, but guys, thanks a lot for, for watching. Uh, subscribe if you want to see uh, any more videos. Hit the uh, little thumbs up button if you would, please. That'd be great. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for watching. Cheers.